So we're going to get right into it immediately, and we're going to turn to the book of Job, and we're reading tonight from chapter 9. Job's uh, uh, book number, chapter 9, and commencing to read at verse 1. Job chapter 9 and verse 1. Then Job answered and said, I know it is so of a truth, but how should man be just with God? If he will contend with him, he cannot answer him one of a thousand. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength. Who hath hardened himself against him and hath prospered, which removeth the mountains and they know not, which overturneth them in his anger, which shaketh the earth out of her place, and the pillars thereof tremble, which commandeth the sun, and it riseth not, and sealeth up the stars, which alone spreadeth out the heavens, and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, and the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, Yea, and wonders without number. Lo, he goeth by me, and I see him not. He passeth on also, but I perceive him not. Behold, he taketh away. Who can hinder him? Who will say unto him, What doest thou? If God will not withdraw his anger, the proud helpers do stoop under him. How much less shall I answer him and choose out my words to reason with him. We will conclude our Bible reading there at that verse, verse 14, and pray that God will bless his precious word to our hearts. Now, last uh, Wednesday evening, I shared with you just a brief uh, kind of introductory passage, and then we led into Job, the perfect man, and his background where he lived, not necessarily where he was born, but where he lived. And I reckon that he maybe came to the area where he was, land of Uz or Edom or Jordan as we know it now, but his friends who came, his three friends, and they were friends, though they didn't decipher what was going on, but they came from uh, southwest Arabia. So he must have had some connection back there that they then came to where he was to sympathize with him and to try to tease out what was going on in his life. But tonight I want to share with you Job the perfect man and God. What a sublime, lofty uh, subject, uh, far too much for us to dwell on, and yet there are truths that we can draw down from what we have been reading, even tonight, where we have just read these opening verses of chapter 9. But it is not by chance, ladies and gentlemen, that we consider tonight Job the perfect man and God, and God's relationship to Job and Job's to the Lord. It's very early in our studies, actually as early as I can make it. But the fact that our consciousness of divinity is so real as we look into the Scriptures, and even when we look over the world, that consciousness of God is endemic to the history of mankind. It has never been known to find a people, however primitive they may be, however far they may have been removed or are removed from civilization, there has not been a people who have been found who do not have a worshiping uh, capacity, who have some concept of God or a God. And if man does not know the living God, he will create a God of his own making so that it is something to worship. And that's endemic to uh, the history of mankind. And that's no surprise, because the answer is found in the very opening chapter of the Bible in the book of Genesis, where the divine trinity met together and said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness. So God created man. In his own image created he him. Male and female created he them. 
That, of course, is a standing fact even in the days in which we live when people don't know sometimes whether they are man or woman. But God created mankind, male and female created he them. And then it's fleshed out a little bit more uh, further on in the chapter, near the end of chapter 1. But the very finger of God is imprinted in our DNA. And I say that thoughtfully because even if we were to fully understand human DNA, I think the very print of God would be in that DNA because we are created with a spirit created by God and created with a worshiping capacity. There is no other part of God's creation that is created with that capacity, the capacity to worship. And even if there was no Bible, Having said to you that what I believe and why I believe it, because it's written in the book, even if there was no Bible, there is enough, says the Apostle Paul, in writing to the church at Rome, there is enough in the very creative heavens around us, in the created heavens, that tell us about God's eternal power and Godhead. So that even if a man never had a Bible and stepped out in a starry night and looked up into a starry heaven, there would be something would be communicated to him that there must be someone out there beyond it, bigger than it, who has made it. And when the apostle writes to the people at Rome, he speaks about that and says in verse 20 of Romans 1, the invisible things of God from or by the creation of God are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. So what we cannot see of God, what is invisible of God, and what is beyond our natural vision is revealed to our vision even in the created heavens that are around us. And that's exactly what the Lord is saying. Even His eternal power and Godhead. So God has to come into the equation of Job's life early. It is, in my thinking, and indeed in Job's living, it's an alpha issue. There is nothing bigger, nothing more vital, nothing more important than man's relationship with God. I may make an assumption even tonight that even as you have come here this evening that you have an association, a relationship with God. That somewhere along life's journey you have had a living encounter with the living God. If you haven't, you have not yet found the source of your life. You have not yet found the source of your peace. You have not yet found the source of real joy and real peace and real assurance and a real preparation for the eternity that lies beyond. But coming back to the subject of the evening to this issue about Job, it is in this twofold relationship in Job's relationship with God and God's relationship with Job, that we see a twofold revelation. We see the revelation of God's character and speaking in relationship to that, and we touched on that last week when I read to you from James chapter 5 about the patience of Job, that we see the end of the Lord, that he is very pitiful and of tender mercy. Now God is more than that, much more than that, infinitely more than that, in many other attributes, but in relationship to Job's life and in relationship to what was happening in Job's life, it was a very tender and a very merciful God who was working out his purpose in the life of this man. And even though the curtains were drawn between Job and God, the curtains were not drawn from God's side. Job didn't know what was going on, but God knew exactly what was going on. And if we didn't have the Bible, we wouldn't know either. But because we have the book, and because we have a narrative at the beginning of the book and at the end of the book of Job, we can see what is actually happening, and then we can fit all the rest of the poetic part of the book into those two bookends, the narrative of what was happening in Job's life. But the end result of Job's testing experience would be a stronger relationship. 
would be a clearer vision, and God would be glorified. And so just like as when Stephen was praying tonight, he was praying about a man who through all his testings would be tried. And what does Job say? He knows the way that I take, and when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. He said, I'm in the crucible. I'm in the fire. The fires are burning, but the refiner is watching, and the dross is coming to the surface, and I'm being tested tested beyond human endurance practically, but God has his hand on the flame. God has his hand on the fire. And you know something, friends? That's always how it is. That's always how it is. The gold to refine and the fire to purify. And praise God tonight, over and above all that Job experienced, and over and above all that we might experience that seems like the dark side of life, that seems like the horrendous experiences of life, I hope that we can still say, I believe Romans 8 verse 28. I believe that God knows exactly what he's doing, and I know that all things work together for good to those that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, God is always working, always working in our lives for our good, never for our ill, but always for our good, and always for his glory. There is nothing that's happening in our lives that is not ultimately going to bring glory to God and benefit to his children. He is always working. The supreme purpose of God in working in Job's life was not Job's happiness. The supreme purpose of God in working in his life in the situations that were developing in his life was actually for Job's holiness, for Job's likeness to the Lord. Now, we've already dealt with what God said about Job. He was a perfect man, an upright man, one that feared God, and one that eschewed evil. And that puts him in a very special bracket of moral character and moral fabric. But God was still working in his life. And Job was learning the ways of God. And God was teaching Job something through it all. And that comes through relationship and sometimes through trial. My granddaughter bought me a book for Christmas. And it's one of Dr. A.W. Tozer's. And she kind of knows what Granda likes, although I had it, but now I've got two copies. A.W. Tozer, The Knowledge of the Holy. And if you were to read A.W. Tozer's books and read The Knowledge of the Holy, it's a, a revelation of who God is, but in the revelation of God, then it formulates my thinking about Him, and that governs my living for Him. And in that book, Dr. Tozer said, and this is such a, brief, uh, such a brief quotation, it needs to be fleshed out, but there isn't time. He said, were we able to extract from any man a complete answer to the question, what comes to your mind when you think about God? What comes to your mind when you think about God? we might predict with certainty the spiritual future of that man. He said, if we were to rightly predict what the church leaders of our day think about God, we might with some certainty predict where the church will be tomorrow. That's a profound statement. And it's no wonder it is in the mess that is in and the quandary, and the departure from biblical principles, and biblical morality even, to this low dregs that we have got to today in institutional religion. I'm speaking generally. My friends, it's because of a wrong concept of God. God's holiness, God's power, God's being. As a man thinketh in his heart, Jesus said, 
And this links in, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our thoughts have more formulation of our lives than we really realize. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And I think it would be true to say tonight that Job entertained very noble thoughts about God. In fact, Job's thoughts about God were so high and so noble that it formed him into the man that suddenly appears on the scene without any real introduction, apart from the fact that he was a great man with a lot of possession, but formulates very quickly in our minds the kind of man he was, perfect, upright, pure, feared God, eschewed evil. Why? Because of his concept of who God was. and his relationship to that God, and his accountability to that God. So again, Dr. Tozer's statement works out even in this context. But there are two aspects of Job and God that I want to think about with you, maybe just one of them this evening. I'll see how the time goes, but I don't want to go as long as last week because it was too late. First of all, Job's knowledge of God And then if we have time, Job's trust in God. Job's knowledge of God. In that reading we had, and it's very difficult sometimes, I've done a lot of time and I've thought a lot and I've been awake a lot during the night and I've turned over in my mind with my message over and over and I've completely redrafted my message from anything that I had before on this. So it's fresh, it's new, it's just like it came out of the, out of the wine press, uh, brought out in the pressures and the trials and the testing and the experiences of life. But how did he come to his experience of God? That's a question you might have. Well, there's no documented evidence. Nothing written down to tell us how uh, Job came to where he had come. We don't know how many years had passed. We don't know what experiences he had passed through before God declared him to be the man he was, a perfect man. We do know by uh, inference that he must have been an adult man because he had an adult family. His children were grown adults. They were kind of out of the nest, as it were. They were having their own lifestyle. They had their own gatherings together, probably for a birthday gathering. And there were ten of them all together. And they would gather all the time for these special celebrations. Nothing in it that would indicate that there was anything uh, wrong or bad or low or mean, but just brothers and sisters, siblings getting together for a special event or a special evening. He was a man with an adult family. But there was a starting point. And that starting point, I think, is very uh, evident even in this uh, Job 29 and verse 4. There is an answer. There's a kind of a little insight into where the starting point was, where we read these words, Job 29 and verse 4, Oh, that it were with me as in times past, as in months past, as in the days when God preserved me, when His candle shined upon my head, and when by His light I walked through darkness, as I was in the days of my youth, in the days of my youth, when the secret of God was upon my tabernacle or my home, when the Almighty was yet with me, when my children were about me. So he covers a a number of different timings in his life. He got a a house, a tabernacle, a tent, uh, whatever. He had got children around him. But before all of that, Job had a meeting with God in his youth. Am I grateful that God stepped into my life and my youth? I surely am. I'm grateful that God stepped into any of your lives, and I'm grateful that He stepped into any of your lives at any age in your life. But I'm deeply grateful that God steps into young people's lives because it's not only a a soul saved, it's a life saved. 
And it leaves open the possibility of growing and developing and coming along with the Lord and maturing and hearing the call of God and going into God's work, you know. You've been hearing something about that even in the last couple of Lord's Day evenings from my brother-in-law Tom and from Harvey on the Sunday night past. Yes, it's wonderful to be converted, to be brought to a living encounter with God when we are young. Some people have a lot of regrets, and they say the greatest regret I have is that I didn't get saved earlier, that I didn't come to hear about this Lord Jesus Christ when I was a young lad or a young girl. But thank God, maybe if you're here tonight and you're older and you say, you know, Pastor Eric, I just don't know the Lord yet, but well, it's not too late, praise God. You can get right in any time, even this evening. And Job got in in the days of his youth. He said, when the secret of God, that word secret means the presence of God, was upon my tent or my home. God became real to Job when he was a young man. And of course, the Bible speaks quite a bit about that, doesn't it? It says, remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Praise God. Did he first learn these things? Where did he learn them? Maybe at a family altar. Maybe at a family altar. If he was from the patriarchal age, and there are those who believe, yes, he was from the age and the era, sometime around the time of Abraham or after it, Isaac and Jacob, and in around that general area and the book of Genesis, if he was from that patriarchal area, then this would have been a very common thing. Abraham gathered his children around him. Abraham taught his children. Abraham, it says in Genesis 18 and verse 19, Moses did the same. God said of Moses in Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 2, Moses was faithful in all his house. Praise God for those who hold and conduct a family altar. Now, when our children grow to be older and adults, and begin to get busy, and begin to develop their own lives, it's not so easy to get together. But the formulative years of our children's lives at the family altar is so profound and so impacting and so vitally important. He used to say the family that prays together stays together. Well, that's a proverb. It's not found in the Bible, but I think there's got to be a lot of truth in it. And you know, train up a child in the way which he should go. And when he is old, original, it, when he is older, he will not depart from it. There is something that is planted by God in the heart of a young person, a child, in those tender years, that wherever they may go, they will never be able to distract or get, they'll never be able to uproot what God plants in those tender years. Because the Word of God liveth and abideth forever. And some of you are praying very much. I want you to take heart. I want you to be encouraged. I want you to believe God. You say, Lord, I did what I knew I should do. I have no regrets. I gathered my children around as Abraham, Moses, and Job, and I influenced them by the Word of God. We prayed for them, and we lived before them, and that's very important. Children see very quickly whether there's any hypocrisy in their parents, whether they're different in church or home than they are at home or whatever, and there's always these readings that are going on in, our heart, in their hearts and in their minds and in their attitudes and their responses, and all of these things feed in to their lives. But I want to encourage you tonight to keep praying now, even if the time has come when they have grown up and the birds have flown the nest. Believe God. Hold on to Him. He will not forget your labor of love.
the Lord will not forget it. And God is able to bring them in. Not only that, Job knew a lot more. Job knew of the sacrifices that were required on account of sin. And he knew of the sacrificial system as a way of approach to God. That's evident in chapter 1. Because whenever his children, young men, three girls, when they had their party and they had their time, it seems like at the end of the year, not every, not every single event, but reading about it and reading around it, but whatever, he gathered them together in case they had offended against God, in case they had grieved God. Peradventure, they grieved him. Job said, I'm not taking any chances to let it go by without offering sacrifice. We've got to make sure, we've got to copper fasten with God that we look after these issues. And he brought them together and sacrifice was offered to God on account of the peradventure that they had transgressed, on account of the sin that may have happened or anything that could have come between them and God. He did this, the Bible says, continually, on behalf of his family. Yes, my friends, we are not called to bring a sacrifice, but on the grounds of the finished sacrifice, we have a place of appeal. We have a, re we have a representative. We have a great high priest tonight. We have one who is seated at God's right hand. We have one who is interceding for us, one who is pleading on our behalf. And to him we have recourse, and my people tonight. Is there anyone beyond anyone else that is really necessary if we have such an high priest who is touched with the feelings and the burdens and the anxieties of our hearts about the issues in our home or in our family or with our children? God is on the throne. Our Savior is at his right hand. They feel, they know, they understand. He is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. My dear friends tonight. Yes, God knew about the sac uh, Job knew about the sacrifices. But as I've said and intimated briefly, the real secret in Job's life was a profound encounter with God. And I began to think about this, you know. And I thought, well, Job didn't have a Bible. He didn't have a preacher, he didn't have a church, he didn't have anywhere to go that he could listen to someone, talk to him about, there wasn't such a thing. But you know something? God is never stuck for a way to communicate with a human heart. God is never at a loss. God is never bankrupt as to how to communicate. And even in our day, the 21st century, there are people, many people, who are coming to the Lord Jesus Christ in lands where persecution fires are raging and no preachers would be allowed to go. And even the stand for Jesus Christ or to publicly confess Him would probably almost certainly result in a death or a labor camp. And yet, do you know something? God is revealing himself to people who have never seen a preacher, never read a Bible, never been in a prayer meeting. God is able to over jump, overstep every barrier when he wants to get in touch with a man. And God overstepped every problem and every difficulty to communicate himself to Job. And Job speaks about that. And I'll just touch on it quickly in passing. In Job chapter 10 and verse 12, and I know some of you are making little notes. You won't remember all these, so that's why I'm giving you the references so you can go back again. And I have it underlined in my Bible. And Job says in verse 10, Thou hast, thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh, and hast fenced me with bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Now I'm indebted here at this little point 
to some comments that were made by the great Dr. Dale Yoakum. I made a brief reference to him last week, and Yvonne and I both heard him and both listened to him preach. And I remember him preaching one time, If thou hast run with the footmen, and they have wearied thee, then how wilt thou contend with horses? How wilt thou do in the swelling of Jordan? That was an outstanding service. Absolutely. He was a wonderful man. But he's now with the Lord. But he said the Hebrew wording is significant. The word granted And the Hebrew word that's used for granted is only used once. And I looked through my Young's Analytical Concordance, and there are other words for granted in the Old Testament Scriptures 15 times, but only once is this word used, and it means to make or to do something. God, it's not a giving something, it's actually a a creative work. God, you have done something. You have made something. You have made me alive, or you have made me to live. And favor, thou hast granted me life and favor. And the word favor means to give and to make an inward disposition of mercy and kindness. God put favor, or God made favor in Job. And then thy visitation, it means to bring to account or judgment, creating conviction of need, of sinfulness. And then the last word, thou hast preserved, it means to set the eye steadily upon, to watch intently. God had done a profound work in him. He had made him something, He had put an inward disposition in him of favor. He had brought him to account, and then he had brought him to a place where he knew that God's eye was set steadfastly upon him. The eye of God watched over him. And as I said earlier, Job couldn't see God. But by virtue of this wonderful encounter, that he makes reference to here in chapter 10 and verse 12. He says, God, your eye is upon me. His eye is on the sparrow, and he watches over me. And when I look back over my life, and I see some of the situations that I've come through, and I've come, um, here I am tonight, Others don't come out as I came out, but here I am tonight, a survivor of two head-on car crashes in my lifetime. God's angels, God watches over me. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. Job knew God was watching him. God had his eye on Job, and you know something? Job believed that. Job believed that. He's still working on me, making me what I ought to be. It took him just a week to make the sun and stars, the earth and the moon and Jupiter and Mars. Oh, how loving he must be. He's still working on me. And he's working on you too. And he has a lot to do yet in your life, And he has a lot to do in my life. And when Dr. Yoakum sat down to begin to write his book on Job, he said to his wife, I wonder what God will pass us through to help us to better understand Job. Little did he know the trials and the pain and the debilitating illness that he would go through before he crossed the the line and the river and went home to be with the Lord. But in it, there was the fashioning and the working and the molding. And we're always on the potter's wheel. Hallelujah. And the potter's got his hand on it. And he knows the pressures to put on. He knows the turns to make. 
And where there is a mar, he does a new thing. He makes it again. And what is the ultimate purpose? A vessel unto honor. And Paul says, a vessel unto honor, sanctified and suitable for the master's use. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, he's still working on us. Praise God. You know, when I was thinking about this the other morning, early, early in the morning hours, I thought about this, and God seemed to speak into my mind. There was another patriarch, you know, and he said, my life is preserved. I thought, well, I'll look him up and see what he did say. And Job was very much in the same frame. My life is preserved. God's eye is upon me. Who was the man? The man was Jacob. There wrestled a man with Jacob at the Peniel Brook all night until he come to realize that it wasn't a man, but it was the living God was working with him, passing him through a deep trial, striving with him, breaking him. What is your name? My name is Jacob. The confession of an inward disposition that was warped, that was crooked, that needed to be straightened. The supplanter, Jacob, and God said, your name will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be called Israel. For as a prince, thou hast power with God and with men. And at the breaking of the day, when Job, or when Jacob got through his struggle, got through his Gethsemane, his Calvary crushing. He came out and it says, as he went up over Penuel, the sun rose upon him and he halted on his thigh. He was a marked man, but the light of radiant glory was shining on his life. My friends, tonight, God may yet have to bring you to a Peniel experience. Oh yes, you say, Pastor Eric, I've had a Bethel all right. I've seen the Angels are ascending and descending on the ladder. I've known there's a communication with God. And I've stepped out from my Bethel experience in Genesis 28 or thereabouts. And I've known that God is real and working in my life. But there's something deeper down. God says, I want to bring you to that wrestling night. I want to bring you to that crushing moment. I want you to be brought to a place where you will give up your right to yourself, Jacob, so that I can give you a new name, symptomatic of a new nature. Thy nature, gracious Lord, impart. Come quickly from above. Write thy new name upon my heart. Thy new best name of love. And whatever way you put it, it definitely was a second experience in Jacob's life. It definitely was a second encounter. Bethel was no less than all that needed to be done in his heart at Bethel. But it wasn't sufficient there needed to be a peniel. There needed to be a crushing. There needed to be a breaking. And sometimes we are strong. We are too strong. And self is too strong. And the eye has never been brought to the cross. And there needs to be the breaking. Brokenness. And any man who has ever got anywhere with God, and any woman who has got anywhere with God, even reading through their lives, even as Yvonne has been doing all those people on Glad Tidings Hour over the last two, three, two years or whatever it has been, I think almost three years now actually, time and time and time again, no matter what their theological background, they're not all Wesleyans, we have had a cross-section of people, but time and again, they come to a living encounter with God where there's a breaking of themselves and an encounter with God where then they step out onto the platform of life ministry, broken but built for God and for His glory to make a mark in the lives of people, wherever they go. I want you to know that God is waiting to do much more for you than he has already done. It is true what was said to Amaziah. There is much more. The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. 
There remaineth much land to be possessed. O oh, deeper yet, I pray, and higher every day, and wiser, blessed Lord, in thy precious holy word. My life, my life, I have seen God. Yes, that's what it said. Jacob called the place Peniel because he said, I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And as he passed over Penuel, the sun rose upon him, and Jacob halted upon his thigh. He was a marked man. I say again, what encounters with the yearning soul? What transformations of inward disposition from sinfulness to holiness? A perfect man in relationship to God an upright man in relationship to people around him, a man who feared God, not afraid of God, but who with a reverential fear lived under the eye of God, knowing that his eye is on me. The things I say, the work I do, the business I transact, the relationships I have, the attitudes I show, his eye is on me. He sees me. He knows me. And when he sees and when he knows what he knows and what he sees, can he still say, that man is just where Job was. He's a perfect man, an upright man, a man who fears me, and my name, and a man who abhors sin. Not only in the outward, outside his life, but the very presence of it within him. This shall not reside within my being. These are some of the edges of God's ways that brought Job to the knowledge of God. And whenever the Apostle Paul had lived much of his life and was writing to the church at Philippi, his appeal and, and cry was, Oh, that I might know him. Not know about him, merely. We can know a lot about him, but it doesn't give us the ability to know him. To know him is another dimension from knowing about him. We can know about him in our minds, but to know him is deeper down. I want to know him. And if this means for me, like for Job, that I should go through, or Jacob, through a trial, through a crusher, to bring me to a place of brokenness, where then when I step out that my life is preserved, God's eye is upon me, I have seen God face to face, my life is preserved, my future is set, my heart is fixed, my devotion is total, my loyalty is undivided, I am all His. I am his integer. I am wholly his. From which we get that word, you remember? Integrity. Well, this is just an opening on his life. The knowledge of God. The knowledge of the holy. I want to know him. This is my quest. Well, I pray tonight that the Lord will write these few thoughts. Is it too, too short? <laughs> Can I stop? No, <laughs> I don't really want to interrupt or break in through to the prayer meeting, you know, friends. But if I will very briefly press you what is left, it'll kind of finish out what I want to say. Job's knowledge of God, Job's trust in God. And there are three windows into Job's trust in God. 
I will merely give you just the bones. It is evident that Job had an unshakable trust in God. It was a fixed issue. And even if he misinterpreted the things that were happening around him. Now here's one. Job chapter 1, verse 20. Job says, after losing all his possessions and his children, the Lord gave. The Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell to the ground and here's the profound, and worshipped, and worshipped. After losing 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses, seven sons, three daughters, and instead of cursing God, or accusing God, or blaming God, which Satan said he would do. He adored God. He worshipped God. And he said, God, you are sovereign. Everything I own, everything I've ever owned, came from you. Naked came I from my mother's womb. Naked shall I return. The Lord gave. The Lord is taken away. You know, when a dairy farmer, as I think now, was turned down in the brucellosis herd, and his whole herd was taken away to the slaughter, and all the breeding of years, those pedigree animals, and the bloodlines that had been built up over a lifetime, when the wagon took them off, it seemed like a death. Now, you would appreciate that if you're any way involved in that kind of thing. Job looked back. He said, the Lord gave. Job looked ahead. He said, naked came I into the world. Naked shall I return. Job worshipped. Job looked up. He looked back. He looked ahead. He looked up. And in the upward look, he retained his integrity. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. And in fact, the word that he uses, it's an amazing thought, but the word that he uses is even before God revealed himself as Jehovah, but the word that's prevalent in the book of Job is the word El Shaddai. God, you are sufficient. You are the breasted one. You are the one who feeds. You are the one who provides. You are El Shaddai. And then, of course, it comes Lord, the covenant-keeping Jehovah God. But he said, God, everything I have, you give me. You've taken it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Of course, the fact of the matter is that God hadn't taken it away. Job took it away. Or Satan took it away, rather. It was Satan who stripped him of his possessions. But God allowed Satan to do it. He couldn't have done it without divine permission. The commendation in chapter 122, in all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. Here's another one. Job chapter 27, verses 2 to 5, where he was mistreated by circumstances. 27, verse 2. Let's just read it because it's important. Job chapter 27. Moreover, Job continued his parable and said, As God liveth, who hath taken away my judgment, and the Almighty who hath vexed my soul. All the while my breath is in me, and the Spirit of God is in my nostrils. My lips shall not speak wickedness, nor my tongue utter deceit. 
God forbid that I should justify you till I die. I will not remove my integrity from me. You know, what Job is really saying, it seems to me, this is what it seems, not, not what it is, but this is what it looks like. It looks like God has removed justice from me. God is vexing my soul. And I feel like saying, this is not fair. Well, that's what people would say, wouldn't they? If you're mistreated by circumstances, or you feel you've been mistreated, and we all have a sense of justice. I remember a lady phoning me one day, and she says, you know, Eric, every man, every person has a sense of justice in their breast. And we see that even from childhood. He got a bigger ice cream than I got. He got two buns. I didn't get, I only got one. It's not fair. And so it goes on. And then, of course, when we become adults, it's spelt out in a different way. But we all feel that there are scenarios in our lives and in adult life whether we either experience injustice or feel we have been mistreated by circumstances or people. And we go alone and we pout and we say, God, what are you doing? Why are you allowing people to do this to me? I feel that my rights have been trampled on. I demand my rights. Oswald Chambers said, the only right we have is the right to give up our right to ourselves. God is always just. God's justice is never imbalanced. But it seems to me that God has removed justice from me. Job thought that God was behind it all. The one he had served, the one he had obeyed, God. I think it was Brian Galt, uh, I think the... And he's a wonderful testimony. He was born with no arms. He was a thalidomide baby. And there were times in his life when he was so frustrated and he said, God, what are you doing? But he came to a place where he turned what seemed like God's injustice in allowing what, was, what happened in his life just because his mother had taken just two tablets for her morning sickness, and he was born without arms. He came to the place where he could take his disability, and God made it his ability to touch lives in many countries in the world. God, I don't understand what you're doing. And this may come into your life somewhere down in the future. There's not a hint of anger, frustration, rebellion, or mistrust. Rather, in Job's life, I surrender my right to myself. I bow to the will of my sovereign. I have no issues with you, Lord. Until I die, I will not remove my integrity from me. And in my notes, that's in block capitals. Why? Because he said, in effect, my whole being is at your disposal, Lord. My will is fixed. Not mine, but thine be done. And you know, in the darkness of the night, this wonderful hymn came to me the other morning two mornings ago perhaps, I worship thee, and the hymn book says, Sweet Will of God. But when Frederick Faber first wrote it, I worship thee, my gracious God, and all thy ways adore, and every day I live, O Lord, I love thee more and more. It's a wonderful hymn. And then the last verse says this, 
Ill that he blesses is our good, and unblessed good is ill. And all is right that seems most wrong, if it be his sweet will. That's profound. Lastly, his trust is firm when all his possessions are gone. His integrity is unshaken when he feels that all his justice has been taken away and his rights have been violated. And his trust remains even in the face of a God who would slay him. And that's the one thing God would not do. And it's the one thing that God didn't allow Satan to do. That you can take everything, but you can't touch his life. That's <coughs> sacred. And life is sacred to God. And before Job was born, he wasn't a piece of plasma. He was a real human being. And he says that. Life is sacred to God. Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Dr. Warren Wearsby said, this is one of the greatest declarations of faith found anywhere in Scripture. The accusations of his, his accusers, it's Job 13, verse 15, I give you the reference, have driven him to the extreme. This is the ultimate test. I will take my case directly to God and prove my integrity. I'm prepared to take my life, if we were to take time to read it, I'm prepared to take my life in my hands by approaching God because he has the right to slay me. If I'm the hypocrite that you men say that I am, then let God reject me. Let him kill me out of hand. If I'm rejected by God, I am prepared to lose my life. Otherwise, I will be vindicated. Whether I live or die, I will not give up. I will not relinquish my trust in him. Though he slay me, yet will I trust. Does it remind you of anybody else? I'll tell you who it reminded me of. It reminded me of Esther, the queen. She said, if I go in to see the king, whom I have not seen for 30 days, I may perish. But she says, I will go. And if I perish, I perish. I take my life in my hands to approach the sovereign. Will I be cut off? If I am, so be it. But I will die in the attempt to save the lives of my people. God said, if I, Job said, if I die in the approach, I am prepared to die. But let him cut me off. I will not let go my hold on him. Job's trust. His possessions were gone. What did he say? Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
His rights have been removed. My integrity is fixed. His life may be cut off, yet I will trust. For Job, it can all be traced back to his deep and powerful encounter with the living God. Thou hast granted me life and favor. Thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink when pressed by many a foe that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe. Deeper, deeper, though it cost hard trials, take me deeper still till my life is wholly lost in Jesus and his perfect will. I think it was, it was a preacher, a black preacher. That's not being racist. He's a black preacher in the southern states. And when racism was rife in the southern states against his people, he stood in the ashes of his burned down church And out of that came the hymn, O deeper yet I pray, and higher every day, and wiser, blessed Lord, in thy precious holy word. Yes, the hymn, Deeper, Deeper, has a background, a Job-like background. But for Brother Jones, what are you saying to me, Lord? I'm listening. And even though you're not speaking, I'm trusting. Amen. Job's knowledge of God. Job's trust in God. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we've pressed through quickly as possible without being irreverent or casual or in any way cursory to the great issues of this man's experience. We pray that we will take some threads of truth and influence that will bring us closer to you, Lord, that will help us maybe even whenever the sword of affliction falls in our home, on our family, in our own lives. God, O oh God, prepare us for all that you need to do and want to do. And we bow before you, Lord, to say, work on in us thy perfect will. Now, Father, bless all those who are here this night, their families, their representative families that are in this gathering, boys and girls, children, young people, others, Lord, strangers to your grace, those who have fallen away from thee, Lord. In the company of thy people, we bring them all to the throne of grace. O God, in these sacred moments, You see the people. You see their hearts. Lord, you feel their cries. You hear them, their burdens. And I pray this evening, O God, in the precious name of our exalted Lord Jesus Christ, answer their prayers. 
but in all situations help them not to loosen their grip on thee, O God. Bless thy word to our hearts. And all who will watch it and see it, wherever they may be, may it ring true to their experience too. In Jesus' holy name, amen.